Once again, I want to thank you all for coming. We appreciate it very much. We would not keep doing this book festival. This is our sixth year, if not for all our uh, very loyal audiences. Uh, we also want to take this opportunity to thank our lead sponsors who make it possible for this festival to be free and open to the public, which it almost exclusively is. So we want all our community and all our visitors to be able to come. So that's we are able to do that through their generosity. Uh, Nantucket Island Resorts, Wendy Schmidt, the Nantucket Athenaeum, to whom we are especially grateful today, obviously in this hall, uh, the Inquirer and Mirror, uh, WCAI, our Cape and Islands NPR station, uh, In Magazine, Haft Productions, the Nantucket Historical Association, and the Dreamland Theater. Um, we thank them all uh, most, most gratefully. Uh, the work we do here is year-round. Uh, we have uh, the book festival is is sponsored by the Book Foundation, the Nantucket Book Foundation, which does work in our schools with our children, and uh, all of that is is made possible by our all of our friends and for supporters, who are many of whom are here. So we certainly. If anybody would like to make a donation, we have donation form forms at the door, and we also have cards that you can fill out so that we can send you, uh, we can get your email address and keep you posted. Uh, after Maria Rana's presentation, she will be happy to sign books, and we also have books for sale, so we hope that you will uh, take advantage of that. And with no further ado, please uh, silence your phones, note the emergency, act, emergency exits, and I now give you a member of our community who is here to introduce Marie Arana, Maria Partida. <laughs> Welcome everybody. I am honored to introduce to you an author of excellence. The book, American Chica, made me travel back to my childhood. Living within two different cultures made me appreciate diversity as it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And made me realize that it is okay to feel that I do not belong here or there, and that my kids will have the opportunity to do great things if they know how to benefit from two worlds that they are in merch. Mary is an author of both nonfiction and fiction, senior advisor for the United States Librarian Congress, director for the National Book Festival, and a writer of large of the Washington Post. She also has written for New York Times, the National Geographic, the International Herald Tribune, Spain's El País, El Peru, El Comercio, among many other publications. Her biography of Simón Bolívar won the 2014 Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Her minor American Chica finalist for the National Book Award. She has also written for two acclaimed novels, Cellophone and The Limanites. Let me introduce to you Mary Arana. Thank you, Maria. What's a, what a pleasure it is to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to thank uh, Theron for inviting me. She said when she invited me to do this, she said, well, you can talk about Bolivar, you can talk about American Chica, you can talk about the, the whole Hispanic experience, and you can just put it all together and, and mix it up. So that's what I'm gonna try to do. I immediately thought when she said that of um, someone whom I really admire, a historian whose name is Germán Arciniegas from Colombia, he had written 50 books, and I said to him, Germán, 50 books, really? And he said to me, Marie, it's only one book. It's only ever been one book. So with Herman in mind, I'm going to talk to you as if this were all one book. Um, I, as, as Maria said, I, American Chica is my story. I was born in Lima, Peru, of a Peruvian father and American mother. 
um, which in itself was uh, living with one foot in one world and one foot in another. And I tried to describe that in American Chica, the, um, the feeling that a child has when the, there are two people in your life who control your life, who are your, your heroes, and uh, they don't always know each other very well. They don't always agree. They don't always get along. Um, to the extent that by the time I was five years old, my father, who um, had a hard time communicating with my mother sometimes and didn't have any trouble communicating with me, would say, would you explain this to your mother, please? And my mother would do the same thing because you know, I spoke perfect English and she was, you know, I was her child. She said, would you please explain this to your father? You get it, why doesn't he? That sort of thing. So by the age of 10, when I came to the States, I immediately went about the work that any immigrant does. Although I wasn't an immigrant, I had a mother who was an American. But I went about the work that any immigrant does, which was to fit in and to put it behind you and to fit in and to um, just try to be like everybody else. And uh, that's what every child tries to do, you know, until you get to about 25 and you realize, gosh, I don't want to be like anybody else. And you, you know, you get spiky hair and tattoos and whatever. But um, at that point, as, as a little girl of 10 years old, you just wanted to be like everybody else. So I became an American. And it was my father at that point who was saying, you know, you're here, sit down, write a letter to your grandmother. You're forgetting how to, how to read and write Spanish. And um, so it was this sort of um, echo of that wonderful, warm life that I had in Peru uh, with a very large Peruvian family who all loved me and who, whom I loved. But I pretty much, you know, went about the business of my education, went about the business of my career, didn't think very much about that little girl. Until I went through a, uh, uh, I was a senior editor at two uh, publishing houses in New York. I went to the Washington Post. I became the uh, literary editor of the Washington Post. Um, and on the first day that I arrived at the Post, I was sitting down at the Human Resources uh, Department, and they were taking my information. And uh, they said, date, place of birth, date of birth. And I said, Lima, Peru, and I the date of birth. And they said, Lima, Peru. And they said, does that mean that we can put you down as a minority hire? <laughs> I said, why, sure, but it, to me, it, ha it hadn't meant anything. No publisher had ever asked me about it. Uh, nobody I'd ever worked for had ever asked me about um, where I where was from. They just expected me to you know, do my business, uh, edit my books, sell all, everything in English, and that was fine. But the Washington Post seemed to care. And it didn't stop in the human resources department. They came to me and they said, even though I was in, I was, you know, had a job to do books and book coverage, it was like, will you go out there and, um, and talk to, there's this population out there that is picking tomatoes in Delaware. Would you, you know, drive a car out there and would you talk to them and tell us, you know, write something about it? I said, okay, I mean, that's extra. Um, and they weren't paying me anything extra, but I thought, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll play girl reporter, and I'll learn how to do that as well. And um, so I started writing, instead of just editing, and just being the literary editor, going out and writing feature stories about um, Hispanics in the area, and the Hispanic population, which is burgeoning, very, very large in the Washington metropolitan area. And uh, because I could speak Spanish, and I could speak to the community, you know, the, the Post was always asking me to do something on top of what I was expected to do and what I, I was being paid to do. So I began to think, um, working with writing about uh, this population, about that little girl that I had left behind at the age of 10, and who was she? And what did that mean? And, and, and so what did it mean? 
to be a Hispanic, you know, and to be a Hispanic in this country is really an interesting thing because um, we don't think of your, ourselves as Hispanics when we come. We think of ourselves as Peruvian, Venezuelan, Ecuadorian, Guatemalan, Mexican. Uh, you don't think of yourself as a Hispanic until you get here. And they call you Hispanic or Latino, Latina. And then you say, well, okay. But what does that mean? What does it really mean? It's not a race. We're every race. We are many ethnicities. We have, uh, in, in Peru, where I'm from, we've had a president who was 100% Japanese. We then had a president that was 100% indigenous, uh, Alejandro Toledo. Now we have a president who's 100% Polish, both mother and father. So what does it mean to be a Hispanic? And uh, in fact, um, you know, the uh, Mexican-Americans have absolutely nothing to do with the Cuban-Americans, and yet they sit in the south of this country and they call themselves, we call ourselves as Hispanics because we all speak Spanish. But it, that's a little bit, I mean, if you think about it, it's a little bit like Americans in this great, wonderful country of ours, because you speak English, you are Anglo-American, right? Not so, uh, not so fast because, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, we are, as Hispanics, every race in the book. And in fact, I was so interested in this topic that I went out and I had my DNA analyzed. And I am every race in the book. I'm black African, I'm East Asian, I'm indigenous, I'm white. All of the races, that's all the, ra the races known to mankind. And uh, so it's not that we come from different places or are, are a community of mixed race. We are sometimes ourselves the vessels of all the races of mankind. So that's got me thinking. I decided to write American Chica because ultimately that relationship between my mother and my father was so interesting to me, so fascinating to me. What did that mean and what cultures had they come from that they really fundamentally, they loved each other passionately. That was evident every day. But they weren't getting things in the same way. They weren't understanding things in the same way. They had different thoughts, different concepts. And so I began to be very fascinated by that, and I wanted to tell the story of their marriage. American Chica is really the story of them, of an American man married to a Latin American woman, and what that means culturally, and what it means for a child who is actually, uh, as I said, one foot in, in two worlds, negotiating that between them, and trying, and, and, and as, as Maria said, you know, not altogether fitting in to each of their worlds, you know, you feel like you're not completely part of the American world as a child of two, uh, of, of a bicultural marriage. And you don't feel completely a child of that world either. It's a new world that you've created in a way. And from there, I decided to write a couple of novels. I mean, I had edited in uh, the publishing houses that I had worked for, I had edited, edited fiction, nonfiction. So I was, I was just toying with this whole concept of identity. And I wrote a novel called Cellophane, which is a, it's a, it's a large novel about a sort of an epic story of a family that for all kinds of social reasons that um, have uh, prevented them from really staying in the urban place where they had come from in Trujillo, uh, out of shame, go to the jungle and create a life in the jungle. And it was part comedy and part sort of an, a, a real analysis of a Latin American family. And it was also about um, that, those social pressures in, in the Latin American society, which are very, very strong. I went from there to writing another book called Lima Nights, in which I wanted to experiment with just a very focused story of two people of different races, different ages, different classes, 
who fall in love in a kind of taboo way in a time of basically turmoil when, when Peru was um, experiencing a, 10 years of terrorism for, with the Shining Path, and that allowed for something like this to happen. It was a very stark, very mean little novel, and I really enjoyed writing it. And then I thought, okay, I've done a memoir of my parents and my childhood. I've done a big epic novel of a you know, large South American family and the social issues. I've done a mean little love novel. And now I wanted to do uh, something that explained the Latin American character. Sort of large writ. Um, and I started almost like a, a parlor game. Who do I find? What narrative? What history? What country? What person? And uh, in this parlor game with myself, I came up with Simon Bolivar. It's an astonishing story, really. Uh, one of the great figures in modern world history. Simon Bolivar, well, you've probably heard him referred to as the George Washington of South America, and there's reason for that. Like Washington, he was a great military hero, he was a founder, he was a president. But unlike most founders, and presidents who lived way back then. Uh, he was born in 1783. Bolivar still has a very, very vivid political presence today in Latin America. Uh, his struggles, his ideals, his notions of who, what Latin America could be, who Hispanics really were, um, uh, it's their relationship to Europe, their relationship to the United States. Um, that whole story of Bolivar is still very much alive in South America in many ways, uh, although the story is more than 200 years old. But it, perhaps I chose it because it touches on every aspect of the Latin American character. Now, think for a minute what it means for someone to have that kind of political durability. There's no, right now, there is no Thomas Jefferson party in the United States of America. There's no George Washington revolution uh, brewing, bubbling away there in the urban ghettos. Um, you're not gonna find worshipful graffiti of um, Napoleon, say, in the streets of Paris or Cromwell in the streets of London. Uh, and you're not gonna find uh, Lenin's Republic of Russia but you will find a Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. You will find a Bolivarian party throughout uh, Latin America, different Bolivarian parties. Um, you will find graffiti in the streets of Caracas and Quito and, and uh, Bogota. You will find graffiti that still say um, La Revolución Bolivariana. You know, the, re the Bolivarian Revolution is still alive. So, why is that? Why would Bolivar still be um, a person whose life and experience still speaks to the people of this hemisphere? And I think to understand that, we need to understand the history. Bolivar's life is one of history's most um, dramatic canvases. It's a colossal story. Um, here is a man who sought and won the independence uh, liberation of six nations. They are Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Panama, and Bolivia. And he single-handedly conceived the liberation of all those countries. And his thought was to put all those countries together to make the United States of Latin America, and it would be a bulwark against the United States of America, and a bulwark against Europe. Of course, it never happened. Uh, the consolidated United States of Latin America. But think for a moment about the ambition of liberating all that land and all those republics. It was a population 
one and a half times the size, uh, at the time as that of North America. It was a landmass the size of all of modern Europe and the odds against which he fought, which was Spain, which was a formidable power of its time, an established world power of its time, uh, probably through Spain, the whole concept of globalism actually began. Um, and he was fighting also these vast, untracked wildernesses of Latin America. You've got the Andes, you've got the rainforest, you've got the jungle, you've got the plains, the deserts. Uh, and he was fighting a revolution through all that geography. And um, he the, also fighting against all of those splintered loyalties of many races, you know, which would have proved difficult for the ablest of generals uh, who had strong armies at his command. And he had never had one day of military experience. Um, he had had no formal military training at all. Uh, he'd gone to, for less than a year, his father had sent him to shape him up. Um, actually, it was not his father, his uncle, excuse me, uh, had sent him to, to uh, learn how to ride horseback, which was a blessing because that came in very, very handy when you're trying to run a revolution. He was rich, he was aristocratic, he was born into one of the wealthiest families of Latin America. They had arrived in this continent in 15, 1500s um, and not long after the conquistadors. And they went on to accumulate a lot of property. They had fields of indigo, fields of cacao, they had copper mines, they had a dozen houses in Caracas, they had huge amounts of land tract. They were very possibly in all of the Americas one of the wealthiest families. By the time uh, Bolivar was two, he had inherited a lot of wealth from a, a dead um, relative. By the time he was three, he was fatherless. His father died. By the time he was eight, he was an orphan. His mother died. Um, by the time he was 19, he was a widower. He had lost his wife. So here was a man who had lost just about everything, very rich, very powerful in his own land. But when he lost his brother, when he, after he was thinking about revolution, and he, they, he sent his brother off to see if he could get arms in the United States of America, he never got past the Caribbean, uh, died in a shipwreck. That was when Bolivar said, that's it. I've lost my father, my mother, my wife, my brother. I'm giving myself to the revolution, which is exactly what he did. He, as his fame grew, because he immediately um, uh, began the work of the, the military aspect of the revolution, um, he was asked to help revolutions all the way from Mexico all the way to Argentina. Uh, his wars took 14 years, imagine that. Um, there was you know, twice the time that the American Revolution took. And in the course of terrible violence, it was a horrible, horrible carnage, the Latin American Wars for Independence. He was beaten back, he was exiled twice, but every time he would come back, he would say, victory is learned in defeat, which is one of the great um, uh, Latin American aphorisms. Uh, and indeed, every time he was routed by this very superior Spanish army that had, you know, honed its, its, uh, its, its uh, talents and excellence in wars in Europe, um, every time he was routed by them, he came back stronger. Now, eventually he learned that the only way that he was going to be able to, to, to um, really be strong against, this, against Spain is to unite all the races. And imagine what that took. The blacks, by, then, by that time, there was a huge population of black slaves in Latin America who were brought over to work in the uh, indigo fields and in the mines. Uh, mulattoes, um, Asians, uh, and there were merchants of the Caribbean and pirates and whatnot and wild cowboys out in the plains of the Apure. And he, he got, he, he was even, um, even uh, recruiting boys who were as young as 11 
and he was going into the hospitals and recruiting invalids. And off they would go, very often barefoot, very often hungry, uh, certainly indigent, and with nothing but sticks. And literally, out with a stick. And maybe if Bolivar could get the cowboys to bring in the horses, a horse. He sent um, ambassadors and emissaries for help to the United States of America. He sent ambassadors to Britain. Everybody said, wonderful, we want Spain out of there. Everybody hated Spain. We want Spain out of, out of there. We want it to be free. We want to um, have a stake in what Latin America is in the future. But they didn't send soldiers. They didn't send arms. They didn't send any kind of munitions. So Bolivar was really, truly, on his own. The only assistance he ever got was from Haiti, from the black president, uh, Alexandre Pétion, who gave him some men and gave him some couple of ships, and off he went, and he, before he did, he said, you know, one thing, that's all yours, go with my blessing, but at the end of this revolution, slavery is finished in Latin America. And Bolivar said, yes, of course, I believe that anyway. Not a problem. Um, and off he went. Now, let me paint a little portrait. How much time do I have? Not much. Uh, a little portrait of Bolivar. I mean, you can imagine, he was physically very slight. This was not an imposing man. He was um, barely, I think, 130 pounds. He, um, even though he was, you know, meager chested and spindly legged and he had hands like a, a young girl's. Um, there was an imposing presence about the man. He had a galvanic way of speaking. Uh, and he was um, so charismatic when he walked into a room, he commanded it. Um, his power was truly palpable in, in this personality that was larger than life when he spoke. Um, he, he had a magnetism that would dwarf much sturdier, much larger men. He enjoyed good cuisine, but he could spend days, weeks, out in the plains, out in the desert, or in the jungle with nothing at all to eat. He um, spent backbreaking hours in the saddle. He rode 75,000 miles on horseback before the revolution was over. Now think about that. That's like going from Alaska to the very tip of South America, Tierra del Fuego, back and forth and back and forth on horseback five times. 75,000 miles. His men so admired him because very often when they were tired, he was still raring to go. They called him Iron Ass. <laughs> But he was equally comfortable in a ballroom or an opera. He was a superb dancer. Um, he kept three or four secretaries in a, at a ball. He kept three or four secretaries in a room because he claimed that when he was dancing, he had the million thoughts going on in his head, and that was when he would compose letters. And so he would go dashing from the ballroom off to the room where his secretaries were, and he would dictate three letters at a time, and then back to dance some more. Um, he was, he read very widely, he spoke five languages, he, um, I say sometimes that he changed the Spanish language for good in Latin America because where it used to be dusty and sort of circuitous as a language in the early 1800s, he wrote and he spoke a language that was um, absolutely immediate and spare and strong. Some of the greatest writing really in Latin American literature, and we're very, very lucky to have it. I, I despair when I think of, of uh, a future when you know, people are tweeting and there is, no, uh, there's, there is no actual literature that is being captured. I mean, when you think of Ulysses S. Grant's writings or Thomas Jefferson's writings or Bolivar's writings, and uh, it's all because it was kept and it was um, written in a very careful manner. Um, when Bolivar claimed his, claimed his first liberation, he, slavery was very, very strong in this country. 
It was probably the, the largest GDG, uh, gross national product um, that the country produced was because of slavery, and sla slavery was the engine for it. And so the last thing that John Quincy Adams or, or um, the James Monroe or any, any of the Madison, anybody wanted to do was to help a revolutionary who was using slaves because what it would suggest to the system in this country would be untenable. So he, 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 he um, got no support from the United States on that matter. In fact, there was a, a, a bit of a scandal here, not too far from here in, in Boston, when um, John, Ad, President John Adams' son tried to actually was very sympathetic and tried to raise arms and got into a lot of trouble for it and ended up in the pokey for a little while because he was trying to raise arms for, for Bolivar. There was no doubt about it. Bolivar was a brilliant general. His story is amazing. I urge you to look into it. It will tell you so much about um, who uh, Latin Americans are because it captures um, a, a kind of a, a, a background of, of the story is of race, the story is of the broad um, effect that Spanish colonialism had uh, on the region, and it, um, it is, it, it's an insight, I think, into the deep, deep differences that I was trying to get at, um, looking at my own mother and my father, having studied American history, and then going back and really throwing myself into Bolivar's story, it was suddenly much, much clearer to me the differences that are then, there were actually, you know, irreconcilable differences between the Latin American and the North American, the South American, the North American experience. And it was a way to get at that. And um, so anyway, that is my big fat 50 books story. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, my big pot and stew of uh, the Americas. And um, so now, you know, what do I do now? Where do I go now? I have to do something different. I can't do another biography. So I would love to take your questions and your suggestions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, please. The Latin American character, yeah, yeah. I think that there, there, there is there, there are there are so many messages. I I want to stick with explaining um, the Hispanic experience to North Americans because I I really don't think we get enough of that in this country. I don't think we know there's such a large population of Hispanics here, and to really understand them, you have to understand the history a little bit. You have to understand the sort of cultural norms as well. And um, so I'm very passionate about that, and I'm very passionate about explaining it. And you know, it's sort of, I feel like I've been given this, having both of these wonderful parents who negotiated these differences every day. Um, and uh, it, in as much as, and I go down to, to Peru every year, you know, my husband and I um, have a place in Lima, and we go down there, I still have a huge family, and I find myself explaining the United States. Um, which is, you know, sometimes a little more complicated. <laughs> but thank you. Yes. You know, I did all my research in two places. Um, one was I was I was lucky enough to be invited to be a fellow at Brown University. They have a wonderful collection of Latin American. Um, stuff, and they have, they're particularly interested in Bolivar. They have a whole room, Bolivar room, which I was able to sit in and sort of soak up the, the good vibes. But, um, and the other place was the li Library of Congress. The Library of Congress, is, it's extraordinary. I mean, there is no Latin American country or Latin American library that can offer you what the, the Library of Congress does. And, and people don't realize it has one of the largest 
um, Hispanic collections, African collections, Asian collections. It's just a, a, an amazing place. So, and I'm, you know, David McCullough, who says, you know, I, you know, I wrote that book on, on Paris and France, and I never left Washington, D.C. Well, I mean, it can be done. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Speaking of institutions and libraries, though, I want to mention, especially because my friend Jay Hammer is sitting there, um, a passion that we have in common which is the American Writers Museum. And if you haven't heard about it, please look it up online. It's the AmericanWritersMuseum.com, which has just opened its doors in Chicago. Uh, just in, what was it, May 15th? May 16th, opened its doors. It is the first museum of American writers in this country. Now, they have you know, museums of Irish writers in Dublin, they have museums, you know, of, of, of uh, German writers in Berlin. They don't, ha we haven't until May 15th had an American Writers Museum. It's a wonderful place and I hope you look into it. And if you're in Chicago, go see it. It's a marvelous institution. Great, great collection of, of American, um, sort of Americana that you would love. Thank you very much for coming, very pleasure. <laughs>